The Holy Gospel appointed for this sixth Sunday of Easter comes to us from John, the 14th chapter, beginning with the 23rd verse. You'll find that in your pew Bibles on page 1676. We are uh, on the left-hand column toward the bottom, beginning with verse 23. Jesus replied, if anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. All this I have spoken while still with you. But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. You heard me say, I am going away and I am coming back to you. If you loved me, you would be glad that I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. I have told you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe. Dear sisters and brothers, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Well, today we will continue what we began last week, and that was addressing the questions you asked when you were invited on the Sunday after Easter to write down a question or two and to place your wonderings or worries or doubts in the offering plate with a promise from me that I would try to address them in an upcoming sermon. So, first up today is one that I believe was written in a child's hand, but I think it's one that adults think about and wonder about too. And that is, are our pets in heaven? Good question. Well, first of all, I'll tell you that the Bible doesn't say anything about pets. But back in Bible times, and still in parts of the world today, uh, only the very, very wealthy had pets because for the common folk or for the poor folk, uh, to have an animal as a pet would mean just one more mouth to feed. So that wasn't a, a practice uh, very, very often and certainly not among the common people. However, the Psalms lift up animals as creatures who, along with people and with angels, are always praising God. Fish of the sea and birds of the air and the creatures of the earth will praise his name forever, the psalmist writes. And so I think if they're going to praise God forever, well, where are they going to do that from, if not heaven? So that is a speculation. It might be a big jump on my part, but I certainly hope that there are pets in heaven. And I guess we won't find out till we get there, but um, I have high hopes. So secondly, a little more serious question, although the one about pets is pretty serious. How do I know that I am following God's plan for my life? Does God have a specific plan for my life? Or is life just random? Those are good questions. Are there only two options, one being a perfectly prepared God-authored script or total randomness? Are those the only choices? Maybe we should start with the basics. What do we even mean when we say God's plan for my life? 
Most people believe that when it comes to the simple decisions of daily life, God does not intervene. God does not plan what you will eat for breakfast or what you will wear to work or if you should paint or wallpaper your kitchen. There are many decisions that we make on a daily basis in which it's very unlikely that God intervenes or even has a preference. But what about the big questions? Questions like, what kind of work shall I do? Whom shall I marry if I marry at all? Should I become a parent? How many children? How will I raise them? How should I choose my friends? Where should I live? How do I prioritize my time, my energy, my resources? What are my core values? What do I want to accomplish in this life? How should I face a big problem? How should I face a serious illness? Does God have anything or everything to do with the answers to those questions? Does God intervene? Does God have preferences beyond that our choices are not sinful ones? Those are just some of the questions and decisions that we're called upon to make in this life. And since we're thinking about God's part in all of this, let's begin with some Bible truths that we know for sure. We know, because the Bible tells us, that we are made in God's image. God is all about relationship, so part of God's plan for each of us is to be in healthy, strong relationships with him and with each other. Relationships that are respectful and loving and mutually beneficial. God's plan for us is that we live in a way that nurtures those relationships. So that's God's plan for our lives. God has given us commandments to live by. We heard the third graders recite them. He gave us those commandments not in order to be a killjoy, but just the opposite. In the Ten Commandments, a way of life is laid out to us, a way of life that, way of life that keeps us in right relationship with God, and a way of life that protects us from others, even as others are protected from us. Imagine it. Just imagine it. No cheating, no lying, no stealing, no murder, no gossip, no jealousy, no greed. Imagine other people, people who are different from us, being regarded as neighbors instead of as threats. All of that seems impossible to us now in this life, which remains sinful and broken, but God's plan for our lives is live, life lived according to the commandments. So just imagine just how wonderful that would be, freed from sin and freed from sin's consequences. So God's plan for us is that we love and trust and obey him. We also know from the Bible, particularly St. Paul's letters, that God has created each single one of us with unique gifts. Gifts meant to be used for the common good. It's God's intention that we be interdependent. God's plan is that we use and share our gifts, not in selfish ways, but in ways that benefit everyone. As others do the same, we are the recipients of the blessings and gifts they share. That's God's plan for us, discovering and developing our various gifts so that all may receive what they need. And throughout the whole Bible, we learn that God wants us to turn to him, to love him, to trust him, to seek him, to follow his ways. He calls us to care for others, to love them, and to forgive them. God's plan for us is that we tend to the vulnerable and see that their needs are met. And surely, surely God's plan for us is that we be his own. The very fact that God's plan is working itself out in your life is evidenced by your presence here at worship today. 
The Bible teaches that it's only by the Holy Spirit that we can say that Jesus is Lord. So clearly you have been responding to the Spirit's prompting simply by being here. And if you want to see a real, succinct version of God's plan for your life, I invite you to open your hymnals to page 236 in the front, 236, where you will see the promises that God calls us to make when we affirm our faith. God's plan for our lives is, as it says on page 236, he calls us to live among God's faithful people, to hear the word of God and to share in the Lord's Supper, to proclaim the news of God in Christ through word and deed, to serve all people following the example of Jesus, and to strive for justice and peace in all the earth. Those are God's plans for our lives. As for God's particular plan for your life, a plan specifically laid out for you, well, I'm not sure that God has a file cabinet full or a hard drive full of detailed blueprints for each one of us, but maybe God does. And certainly, as Lutheran Christians, we do believe in the doctrine of vocation, that God calls us to our work, and that when we do our work to the best of our ability and in loving service to our neighbor, we are doing God's work. I know I've shared this before, uh, but it fits so well Martin Luther's famous saying on this topic of vocation. He said that if a cooper is building a beer barrel and that beer barrel leaks, well, the cooper was neither serving his neighbor nor glorifying God. In other words, any kind of work can be holy when it's done well in loving service to the neighbor and with the intent of glorifying God. So think about the gifts that I mentioned, the gifts that the Apostle Paul writes of that you have been given. Each one of us has been given gifts. Think about what are you good at? What do you enjoy doing? Now, sometimes for the really lucky people, the answer to those questions can lead you to the kind of work at which you can make a living. Sometimes those things will have to remain only a hobby. I love Frederick Buechner's quote about vocation. The place God calls you to is the place where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. I'll say that again. The place God calls you to is the place where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. Well, what if even that doesn't help? Some people hear from God in different ways. Some people are gifted with a very keen sense of intuition. They sense whether something is right for them or not a good fit. Sometimes it's a gut feeling that tells you this is for me, or maybe no way, this would be a disaster. Sometimes things fall into place like a row of perfectly aligned dominoes, and at other times, the road closed sign appears when you've barely gotten started. Sometimes God comes in a still, small voice, giving you a sense of peace when you've settled on something, or a sense of dis-ease when you're leaning towards something that isn't right for you. I think that all of those are ways in which God communicates with us. If you get a strong feeling that something isn't right, it probably isn't, and you should pay attention to that feeling. It is a rare person upon whose head God drops a brick with a blueprint for life attached. But if you sense a sign either of encouragement or discouragement, pay attention. I do want to tell you the story, though, of some people who 
for whom it was really like a brick with a life blueprint uh, attached to it. My niece, Kendra, and her husband, Jeremy, were living and working in Duluth, Minnesota. They had a home. They had started their family. They owned some rental properties. Jeremy worked at the College of St. Scholastica, and my niece, Kendra, was a speech and language pathologist in uh, the Duluth School District. But Jeremy had received an offer to serve at a college in, a Christian college in Alaska. And Jeremy had been born in Alaska. He was adopted by his parents when he was just a few days old, but he kind of had this pull to Alaska. So even though they knew it would mean a big change and uprooting lots of things, they thought, well, we'll at least go and talk to the people and learn a little more, find out what this is about. So they flew, Kendra and Jeremy flew to Alaska, and uh, he had the, Jeremy had the interview, and it went well, and they indeed wanted them, and uh, they provided housing and all kinds of things. So uh, they were really, really tempted, but still, oh boy, it would be quite a cut in income, and then, of course, in Alaska, the cost of living was quite high. So just for a fluke, while they were there, Kendra got on the computer to see if there happened to be any openings in the Kenai School District. Lo and behold, they were hiring for a full-time speech and language pathologist. That was kind of a, a brick drop to the head. So they spent five years there and uh, had a wonderful time. We're not always so lucky to get a blueprint for life wrapped around a brick dropped in our head, on our head or in our laps, the way Kendra and Jeremy were. But still, God is with us in those decisions. That goes for choosing your work, a life's partner, or making a decision about a major life change like pulling up stakes and taking a job transfer across the country. Maybe it's about when you should retire or if you should sell your home and, and downsize and move into an assisted living apartment or give up your car keys. And discerning that sense of what's best even applies to end of life decisions. Do I try one more round of treatment? Do I have one more surgery? Do I take my loved one off of life support and keep him comfortable? In each of these things, pray. And pay attention to that inner voice that's prompting you. If it brings you real peace, it is most likely of God. Get advice from loved ones, of course. But remember that your decision is yours to make not theirs. And remember this, even if God does send you a blueprint for your life, it's highly unlikely that you would follow it exactly. Because we are all broken people. We are all sinners. Obedience isn't exactly our strong suit. Just like when you stray from your GPS's recommended route and you hear a voice say, recalculating, so God remains with you in your life and in your decision making, redirecting you to salvage the situation you've gotten yourself into when you don't follow instructions. That's why mistakes are learning, exp ex learning experiences. Hopefully whatever caused you to veer off the right path will bring with it some valuable lessons. Remember what Paul wrote to the Romans, all things work together for good to those who love God. Another thing you might be doing, doubting that God could or would use you to do his work and will in the world, remember this, using people like you and like me is precisely how God accomplishes his work and will in the world. Throughout the Bible, we see God using the most unlikely of people to do ordinary things with extraordinary results. 
And the same is true for each one of you. You can count on God wanting to use you and use your gifts to help bring in his kingdom. It's all part of his plan for you. Now, God may not be as obvious as you'd like in leading and guiding your life, but he is there. Always, always at your side, encouraging, discouraging, prompting, or delaying. You can rest assured that God is working to make his intended world a reality and that God is using you to do it. As God said to Jeremiah, I know the plans that I have for you. Plans for a future and a hope. As Paul writes in his letter to the Ephesians, for we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And as Jesus answered when asked, what is the greatest commandment? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. That is God's plan for your life and for mine. The rest is really just details. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.